Okay, welcome to another episode of The Spotlight with Sean O'Rourke. In the spotlight today, Emmy-nominated director, writer, and executive producer, Timothy Woodward Jr. He has a new film in theaters right now titled The Call. It stars Lynn Shay, Tobin Bell, and Chester Rushing. Let's get right into it. Tim, it's yeah, good to see you, good. bro. Uh, you've had a stellar year so far. Uh, you've been nominated for emmys for your show studio city that's on amazon prime uh, video that's streaming and you were nominated for writer nominated for director nominated for executive producer i mean how, look i've seen pictures of you at the emmys walking red carpets for for i know you go and that, that's always been a dream and a goal for you yeah. and then like yeah. to get to get those certificates in the mail that say you were nominated for, for, for all the hard work. First of all, you know, we've known each other since 2006. Uh, and I remember when you moved out to Los Angeles and, you know, you started really humping it and making it work for yourself. And I've watched, watched it grow. Boom, boom. Every movie, one after another, after another, How, you're on your like 13th film now, right? I think it's more than that. Um, I think it's technically 17, but Se the first couple were, you know, Five thousand dollar movies, so you know probably fifteen that are that I would say has been you know with a real distributor and a and a, and a budget to make it. Um, so yeah, but no, thank you for the kind words. And um, you know, twenty twenty has been a good year professionally. Um, it's been rough for a lot of people, so it's hard to you know say yes thanks to twenty twenty. Uh, but you know, um, yeah, I know a lot of people are struggling and a lot of people are having a hard time financially, health wise. So first, you know, that's a big thing, but. I think that personally, as far as at least the business aspect of it goes in my career, I think it's been incredible just because of the, you know, there's been a lot of work. As you know, you were out here um, what, three, four years ago uh, when I did Trade with Chris Christopherson, came yep. out, did a great job in the movie, and we had fun. But I think even uh, for me not seeing you in a while, as you got to come on my set, you know, we kept up talking and stuff, but you actually got to see how you know, much the growth had happened and how much my set was like a family and how big it was and just how we were kind of in that forward progress. And I think um, through doing tons of movies and films, you just learn, you know, you, you yeah. surround yourself with people who are, you know, and that's it. And, it's, and that, uh, that's, that's and the it's key nice is, that's the key is surrounding yourself with good people. And, you know, I've noticed you've done that with all of your films and we want to talk about the call, which is your movie that's currently in theaters right now. It's a horror thriller. Yeah. Is that, you know, that can be uh, yeah. a good way to sum it up. It stars uh, Lynn Shay, Tobin Bell, and Chester Rushing. Um, ha I mean, I know this, is, this isn't the first time you've worked with Lynn Shay. She did uh, The Final Wish with you, which was another film. Uh, yeah. uh, is this your first movie with Tobin, right? Yeah, first movie with Tobin Bell. First, uh, I produced a movie with Chester Rushing. Um, but yeah, first movie with Tobin Bell and, and Chester and second movie with Lynn. And, and I'll tell you what, man, you know, and, and again, like I remember years ago, you and I having conversations about how much you loved Final Destination, that movie. And then yes. th this, this movie, The Call, was written by Patrick Stibbs, uh, uh, yeah. who was the creator of Final Destination. So one of the, one of the things that I, I, I love is that like, it's almost like a full circle. Like you loved a movie and a concept back then. And then you get to work with the creator of that on your brand new feature film. And that's, that's pretty badass. Sure. Yeah. So one thing about, I did love final destination. I love the whole franchise. So just to give a, a run around on that. So Patrick wrote the call, Jeffrey Reddick created final destination. Who's a producer on this. Okay. Jeffrey wrote, however, the final wish. So Jeffrey worked with me on The Final Wish, and he had wrote that. That was his story, his script, his original. So when we started talking, I asked him, I hunted him down, actually, and said, hey, do you have a script? I would love to do it. So year one, back in 2016, he just completely ignored me, like in every way, shape, or form. He's like, yeah, maybe if I get something. So then I did, uh, you know, Hickok and Traded and Gangsterland. I just kept sending him trailers of my movies, legitimately, like, do you have anything? So I sent him Gangsterland when it was coming out and he watched it and he's like, holy shit. And he's like, yeah, I think I've got something. Check this out. And then let's, let's team up on this movie. So that was how the final wish came about. And we got with Lynn Shea. 
So when Lynn and her manager found this script and they really liked it a lot, they brought it to me and said, hey, will you direct this? And one of my first things was like, hey, can we, can we get Jeffrey involved? He came in and he really just became this creative producer who helped us with the deaths and just who, who and I, him and I spent probably 30 days going back and forth on, this is what I want to do, this is how. And he was beside me almost every day on set just changing little things that I wanted. Um, not to the overall story per se, but just a lot of tweaks, a lot of, you know, again, improving the deaths, changing some of the locations and stuff like that. So it was a really, uh, it was a good, you know, it was a good creative atmosphere and environment and I'm forever thankful for it. And uh, it was a dream to work with Jeffrey then and a dream to work with him now. Well, I, and I think that's fantastic. What, you threw out a couple of uh, movie titles that you have uh, directed and produced. Uh, and one of them was Gangsterland that had Milo Gibson. That's Mel Gibson's son was one of the leads in that yeah. and Jason Patrick, right? Uh, just, Patrick, just, just for the viewers. Uh, 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 and then also uh, Hickok had Luke Hemsworth, uh, Chris Christopherson, Trace Atkins, and Bruce Dern. And you've worked with Bruce Dern on another film. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, he was, violent. yeah, yeah. And, um, and then Trace Atkins, you worked with, uh, and Chris Christopherson in, in Traded three times. Yeah. And see, that's the thing that I love that your talent that is attracted to the projects that you produce and work on, they want to keep coming back. And that, yeah, bless him. that's great because, you know, it just goes to show you the, the bonds that, you know, you, you look at someone like uh, Scorsese that has his De Niro, or now he's got his Leonardo DiCaprio, like, like you have a tendency to attract the same people over and over and over again. And I think that's fantastic. And that, that just goes to show the strength of the films and stuff that you're doing now. Um, I love it, man. I, 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 my favorite part when on, on one of your new movies comes out is like, who's going to be in it. And, uh, but also behind the camera is important too. Pablo Diaz, you work with him over and over and over again. He's a great cinematographer. When I was out there working with you on Traded, he, you guys like would finish each other's sentences, even though, you know, he's speaking, what, speaking Portuguese, right? Or, <laughs> or Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. 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 uh, 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 you know, it's like you guys were still on the same page when it came to everything. Boom, boom, boom. Like he knew exactly what you wanted and vice versa. And, um, and again, yeah. every time you have a new movie come out, I'm seeing Pablo's right there. Pablo's right there. Boom, boom. I'm like, man, he's got yeah. his family. He's got his family. And, uh, and that's yeah. really good stuff, man. Thank you. Yeah. Pablo is so talented and he's, uh, we've kind of got this, like we're almost married in a way we, we are, we're on set, we're going at it. You know, his job is the visual, my job is everything. You know, it's the visual, but it's the acting, it's the performances, it's the locations, it's all. And so, you know, we it's a really good creative partnership because we're bouncing ideas off of each other. And sometimes he thinks I'm insane when I say it, but I've watched him so much now and learned so much from him to where now I say things and I start talking about the light and he's like, Whoa, hold on, hold on. And I start telling him and then he tries it. And he's like, Oh shit, this is cool. And so there was a couple of moments like that on studio city and then a couple of things like that. But, uh, you know, we, we learn from each other and we, we've, we've both been growing and, um, you know, he's, he's the first call that I usually make on a movie immediately. As soon as in-house status says, Hey, we want to get involved. It's automatically to Pablo going, okay, we're ready to rock. Let, let's go ahead and do this. Um, and, you know, he's there with arms wide open and we, you know, we're, whether it's trying out new anamorphic lenses, doing different things with lights, velvet light has been a big sponsor and part of what we do. We just kind of look at the challenges and say, let's rock and roll. That's awesome. Your new movie, The Call, it's in theaters now. Um, mm -hmm. You're about to, are you catching a flight to Vegas to go to a, to go to a premiere? I'm or driving. Screen? I'm going. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. I, I was going to fly, but I'm not going to just because the amount of time it would take to get to the airport, unpack, you know, the whole yeah. thing is about the same amount of time. Yeah. But yeah. We, we, it's cool because we opened up on a couple of hundred screens last week. Um, and, you know, we ended up coming number one in several of those screens and had the box office per screen average of like number three. And all this week, we've actually been number one every day this week. That's so then it awesome. started. Hey, yeah, it's cool. It's, a, you know, it's during a pandemic, but we've, you know, we've got Tenet this out. We've got the new mutants this out. We've got a lot of unhinged Russell Crowe's movie that's out. We've got a lot of movies out. There's almost 20 movies out. So it's a big deal for us. And then this opportunity came where they said, hey, look, would, you know, do you want to go to Vegas? Well, 
Well, Obviously, who doesn't want to go to Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for a premiere on, you know, red carpet, little, you know, socially distanced, of course, and safe premiere to kind of help kick this thing in high gear more as more theaters start picking it up and as we kind of keep going. So, I was, yeah, absolutely. So I didn't find out until yesterday that I was going for sure. Um, so it's cool. I'm excited, it's, you know, tomorrow and it's going to be just fun. It's fun to, you know, you work on something so long, especially when you're directing, because you don't just go off a set. I mean, you live with it in post. You literally live with it. I yeah. have some scenes that have 40 versions of an edit, especially during COVID, because I had to move everything from my office to my spare bedroom. So I'm like sleeping at 12 o'clock at night and I'm like, fuck, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go cut the scene. I got an idea. And so it's like for someone who is like really hasn't just a, you know, I'm, I'm very, I, I like to just want, I want to do it again. You live. Yeah. And so, you know, when you spend this much time with it, when you're in, you know, when you're, when you're cutting it at 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock, 40 different versions, it's really good to be able to kind of um, enjoy that process. And one thing that I started doing, you know, when I, when I came out here, a part of growth was I used to believe that, you know, Hey, you do a project, you could just celebrate it and it's good times and people give you kudos. And, and what I learned is it's about the work. So if you notice any of my projects, uh, you know, I may have told you, or some close friends, hey, look, I've got this going, but there's no post or anything until we're ready. You know, until right. it's coming out, one of my first posts is now going to be, here's the trailer, the movie's coming out in three days, you know, three weeks. Um, it's not about saying, hey, I'm shooting this movie now anymore. It's not about any of the instant gratification. It's really about the growth, the long term. And I learned how to, you know, enjoy the process. You know, Yeah, and, because and if you, you that, yeah, when you put in all that work, all the other stuff comes naturally yes it does right it does right. And but what it yeah takes, so yeah because you know you want that instant gratification sometimes of doing something and you can see the answer you say oh you know i'll put this on twitter facebook then i'm on set i'm getting ready to do this but then there's the urge of going you know what if i do this right and i work at this and i focus only on this people are going to know about it they're going right. to find out at the right time and it's going to be much more i'm not going to feel like i can slack off because i've already got the pat on the back i've already got the great job I haven't gotten any of that yet. So now I've got to earn the great job by making the movie, by delivering the movie, by making sure that, you know, it comes out, it gets released and is successful for my distributors that I've been working with on 12, 13 movies, 14 movies. To, yeah. You're you know, so you're, you're still working, you're still working with Syndyme to. Uh, Syndyme, yeah. Syndyme. Yeah, definitely great relationship. Uh, they actually just put out a press release today about the success of the movie and how overwhelmed they are with the box office, which is a big deal because it came directly from the CEO, Chris McGurk, who used to be, uh, you know, the CEO of Disney um, and with Universal. So, you know, it's a, it's a big deal to have that kind of, you know, they've got a hundred person staff there and they really work behind me and I'm, I've become their biggest partner. I went from them offering me a small deal to, you know, being, becoming their biggest partner and them giving me opportunities to, to do a Western, a gangster movie, a horror movie, things that they normally don't do. Yeah. Say, yeah. See, that's, I that's something that I love too, about all the films that you make is that you, you, you can go from genre to genre and not miss a beat. You, you're knocking out Westerns. You're knocking out horror films. You're knocking out action films. And also what's good about that is, you know, you and I have talked before in the past about how you know, you have to follow the trends, you know, because it's, it's show business. So you want to make good projects and you want to make things that are commercially successful, but you all, you also have, you have people that you have to look out for like your distributors. And, and so you're looking at trends. So if you're yeah. going to make a Western, you make a damn good Western when all the regions around the world are buying Westerns. So yeah, it's not chasing, it's finding that right script and finding those right people. And I mean, Chris Christopherson. I mean, come on, yeah, Bruce Dern. Man. Like you, when you get these people into these, into these projects, you know, it's just a whole nother world, man. And, uh, and again, but listen, I don't, I don't want to, you and I can talk for that's hours. A blessing, though, about being, that's a blessing about being busy though. I think is, um, you know, as, as you know, the first time I worked with Chris was on traded. Um, yep. I think you were there for his first day or second day. Um, and, you know, he had a big moment where, you know, he was going to say goodbye to all of to, this. To filmmaking. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember I, that was an emotional yeah. day. I just remember well, off to the side, the, just the, the, watching what was going on with him because yeah. th there was that beautiful moment where he literally was giving away his horse to walk off into the sunset kind of thing. And because he was retiring. Well, those were his boots. Those, those, were, his those boots. were the boots from the first movie he yeah. ever did yeah. in a, as a Western. Billy and Kid, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah uh-huh. Billy the Kid. Yeah, 1970s. He wanted to go get him, and there was a thing at the time. Uh, his wife and him. He had been diagnosed um, for like you know, thinking he was going to. He had dementia. Dementia. Or yeah. Working with him, I was going no, 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 because he doesn't need this. Like, like he's remembering everything, and he's skipping past these lines because it's in his memory. And Miss Lisa ended up taking him to a specialist after that movie, and they found out that he actually had Lyme disease and not that. Because and not dementia. Film. Yeah, and so Lyme disease is a treatable cool. disease. And then, and then, yes. sure enough, and after he was treated, yeah. he was back being a Rhodes Scholar, yeah. you know, uh, performing and and going on performing. tour again. And then he came on, yeah, and then he came and did Hitchcock with me, and uh, you know, we had him for a lot longer during that period of time, and uh, we just had a good working relationship. And uh, you know, Miss Lisa was just extremely happy with it. And Trace was, you know, that's his idol. So he was super stoked to get him back. And, you know, Chris, Chris, Chris talks and you just have to listen. I mean, he just yeah. has that wall to him and that just real, you know, this guy has lived his life. You know, he's lived such a full life. He's been a superstar in movies and music and, you know, a helicopter pilot, a road scholar, you know, I mean, the guys live. So to feel that, but to be a part of those like special moments where, you know, I'm so busy going 14 hours this day. And, you know, I know Chris is working, but it's great because then you don't get the chance to realize how big the moment is. You're just there, you're in it. And so that was one of those moments where when I found out that Chris wasn't going to do another movie, it was on set. So I said, listen, hey, if you guys come back tomorrow, Miss Lisa, I have an idea that I want to run past you. What if we give him a send off because it would work in the story? And they were just so actually moved by that, like that I would do that. And, uh, you know, they came back the next day and that's when we did it on set, um, yeah. his, his scene. And it was just such a big moment. I think that I remember seeing you across the way where I'm directing it. So I'm not looking at anybody but Chris but everybody's behind me. Yeah. And I remember in the moment after it was done where I was like, cause we were, remember we we're chasing the sun too. Cause the sun was going down, That's so right. we were losing light. So I remember when I got it, I just kind of gave a big, whoa. And, you know, kind of like gave Chris a hug or whatever. And I turned around and everybody like grown men, like everybody's like teared up yeah. crying, like, you know, just emotional watching this legend saying goodbye. And uh, you know, those moments that you get, are once in a lifetime and if i think if you have to if you had the chance to just look at the magnitude like if you're sitting around not doing anything and you're like wow i gotta do this wow i gotta do this i think i'd handle it a lot different i think i'd fuck it up excuse my language but i think i would yeah because i think it just overwhelms you so one good thing about working with a lot of people in these movies is that when i'm busy and i'm going i don't get the opportunity to go oh shit it's mickey rourke i gotta worry or jason patrick or peter fatch or or anybody i just kind of get to come in and and really do everything so one of the amazing things about is when you're running around and you're doing all these things and and you're trying to you know improve the film these actors are, are watching you and they know that you care so much and then you start doing their scenes with them and you work it out with them and you know you give suggestions you listen but i always love to give actors the freedom of going hey do what you do let's talk about it and i try to approach it from that point and so i think that they realize okay they want to come back but one thing that's important with that is they can't just have a good experience on set the movie has to turn out good right you know the movie right. has to be there. even if they don't agree somewhat creatively on a choice technically it looks really good it's a solid film as a whole so you know maybe every scene is not what their preference is, you know, as I'm directing. So it's going to be mine, but it's definitely something where they go, okay, wow, a lot of care went into this. And I think that that's one thing that we hope that you could take away from our movies is that we have a lot of care in our movies. You know, we really, you know, we, we, I look, I I woke up in the middle of the night directing my dog one night, you know, I wake up and I'm like, if we just get this one more, you know, and tell tell it. That that being said too, you know, uh, I I know I've, I've always thanked you, privately but publicly you know in this uh, you know you you looked out for me and it just goes to show you the love because my dad had passed away and i had come out to california and you said hey come on down and and be a part of this be a part of this movie and you were like you know chris christopherson's in it and trace adkins and michael Pere, and i was a huge fan of michael Pere, and and i came to set and i was just supposed to be some guy in the background getting shot in a gun battle it, that was all uh, and yeah. then and, and then by day three you're I'm, I'm getting handed like five pages of dialogue and i'm freaking out going wait a minute yeah. what is what is going on and and that was a great opportunity for me and but again it it was fun it was it was a good time 
you did a good job with it. But you remember we, you and I started talking about what we could do with that character because it wasn't written like that where he was like this germ right. guy, you know? Right, right. He was just more of like a ticket, please. And we were like, you know, what can we think about? And so the idea was, I remember I saw this dust everywhere because the light was shining through the window and there was this dust. And I said, man, you know, this guy really just felt like when anyone touched him, there's like a flesh or something. Oh, yeah. And then you start playing it back and you did your lip. I remember you looked at it like that's nasty. I said, use that. Use right? that. Yeah. So every yeah. Time you, did, you were kind of like looking and you gave these little nuances, like looking at her fingers and touching the, you know, stuff and you're thinking about the skin or whatever your process was. Yeah. But it just added so much to that to where it made it very interesting. And people commented on it. And then I remember when Michael Perret came in and the glasses, we made that up too. It's like take off your glasses. Yeah. Because he was yeah. just supposed to you know, but it's so cool. You go, what read what for, you know, and bow, pop, yeah. you know, so those are, those are things that I love. I, I love that part about making movies because it's organic. You're watching the environment. You know, it could be written in a script where it's a train station. There's 30 people walking by. It's this, and you know, maybe you don't have that, but you look at what you have and you go, does there need to be tension in this moment, in this script? How can we make it where we're not just relaying information? Because you could easily come in and go, I haven't seen her. She hasn't done this, be the guy and move on but we need to feel it not at ease. And so when you see you with the daughter, when, when, the, when Mike Perret comes in, you're feeling not ease. You know, you already know that this dude's probably done something, even though we didn't right. show anything that happened. Right. Because right. you're like, this guy's not right. You know, yeah. don't listen to yeah. him. And, you know, that's what you want to take away from, uh, uh, the, you know, it makes, it makes the scenes have more tension. And, and, you know, I love that part of being able to, you know, see behind the script and, and being able to find something there, something magical, something well, organic. Well, again, I, I just wanted to publicly thank you because, you know, that, that was an awesome experience it. to have. And one, one of my dreams as an actor was always to be in a Western and you actually made that dream come true, which was really cool. Well, you'll now, have to jump in another one. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, the Call, again, Lynn yeah. Shea, you got Tobin Bell, you got Chester Rushing. Um, this movie t tell me what this movie is in a nutshell now i now i saw the other day the the trailer just on one web page uh or, or one channel on youtube that was promoting it had i went back and checked again two hundred and sixty thousand views and then there were other channels that mirrored it and cop and they were twenty thousand yeah. ten thousand i mean you've got you're clocking almost half a million views on the trailer for this yeah. movie that's in theaters right now and the comment section was lit when Great. people saw Lynn Shay and Tobin Bell in this. Yeah, yeah. All you saw, comment after comment on YouTube, was my two favorite epic, you know, horror people. I can't believe, I can't wait to see this movie. I mean, it was just over and over and over and over again. That's got to give you some sort of satisfaction too, because you're like, yeah. you're you're hitting this genre, and you're taking the best of the best right now, from the Saw franchise, from the Conjuring, you know, the uh, franchise, mm -hmm. and you're you're putting this together and, and the fans are already so excited about this movie. That's gotta be awesome. Yeah. yeah, it is, you know, and it's, it's, it's cool because the trailer, when it went out, so we found out that we were going to release in theaters, I think three weeks ago. So I was running around like a madman going, <laughs> oh Hey, God. because well, yeah, well, so these things happen where wonder woman push and yeah. there's all these screens people need you know they need content to fill it so my my theatrical bookers and our guys are going hey look the theatrical bookers are like hey you know what can we do the october 2nd i said well you know that's very soon so we basically <laughs> released the trailer only like 10 days i think it was wednesday and it was coming out the following friday so not friday two days from then 10 days 10 days so that's all the trailer had to go before we were going out and then there was all this press and my uh, the, the publicist that Cynodon hired and thank God for them because they jumped in and just started, you know, Cynodon just started their machine cranking and Kim was like, Tim, you're crazy. Can't believe we're doing this. But let's go. And let's, you know, and I'm like running around trying to deliver this and that. And, uh, you know, they just started heavy and we just had all the articles and the, the YouTube channels. I think there were, there's almost 200 versions they tracked of the trailer that are out now on YouTube off of the one single feed. That it's crazy. And what we knew it was cool because when we released to the Hollywood Reporter, they had a 36 hour exclusive window. And before we could get it out to anyone, people had ripped it. There was already 20 people that had ripped it from the Hollywood Reporter. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, this is going to be, you know, something we're going to have to, 
And you know me, I'm bitching about the quality. I'm like, they ripped it. It's only 480. Like there's not even a 1080 file. I'll yeah, send but, them a fucking. But, but, but then, but then when you look at how many followers their channel has and it's like, you know, yeah, 1.4 yeah. million, it's like, Oh no, it's okay. They can have it. Yeah, at, yeah, at, no, at 480. It. Well, <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's what you said. It's not as much even about the views anymore as it's like the comments, the comments, it's the people that can like and hate. And you know, we got, I think it's like 90, 94% like, and maybe 5% or less hate, which is great, you know, to yeah. have because there's always people that are going to jab, but it's usually you want to have like a, a 90, 10 is great. And I think we have like a 96, four or something, which is good. Uh, but then, you know, all these people, you're right. They're commenting like crazy. And there's a few that are being funny. There's a lot that are just like, Oh my God, I got to see it. And Sidious yeah. and Saul have a child and, you know, it's just exactly. it's not 500 plus comments, but uh, that's what we've gotten at the theaters. And people have said, hey, you know, the theaters are, are like over the moon, excited, happy. And uh, Lynn Shay did a personal shout out for every theater chain where she's like, hey, this is Lynn Shay. Make sure to check out my new movie, The Call, at Galaxy Theaters, at Premier Theaters. So we wanted to support all the local chains with that, too. And it was nothing that was a requirement. It was just an idea of during the pandemic, let's welcome everybody back to the movies that want to go yeah. um, and let them know about safety protocols and everything else. So we kind of had that and they all started sharing on their Facebook. They were, you know, putting ads out. So then it was just a snowball effect that now somehow, you know, our movie opened up in 25% of the theaters at number one, 25% at number two, and, you know, another 27% at number three. And, you know, for the last um, several days monday through thursday we've had the number one grossing box office average per screen um wow you know other than any other movie which is uh, you know such a a, a crazy thing to think about because 2020 again it's a year of this and that and i've had a top 10 box office now officially and you know i got three personal emmy nominations and my show had eight so it's kind of like you know it's there yeah. and speaking of going to events and stuff though that was one of the thing about this year is uh, you know, when I first got here in 2012, I went to the Emmys and I went with Lauren. I said, next time we go back, we're going to be nominated or I'm going to be nominated. She wasn't even in film that time. And so 2020, I hadn't been back in 2020, got the nominations ready to go. And then they and, canceled the in-person yes. Emmys. Yes. Yes. And so I'm like this right now where you're worried about me freezing. It's like, eh. And while I'm talking to them at the, the virtual Emmys, and that was the weirdest experience of my life. I'm in my living room with this camera set up that they like tell you about and how to do it. And, you know, it's like you're in this room where there's a control panel, as you can see every, and you see your other people. And they're like, we're going to boost you to the stage. And they literally move you over. So then your views like of the guy on the stage. Oh, and, wow. Like, it was the weirdest experience. But then people are cutting out people's mics are going, there was like echo feeds going on, like where your ears would just be, and it was just the wildest, like, and the delay on the TV was like a minute and a half later, like of when it was actually happening, like when the awards were coming. So I'd already knew I lost one category and I'm like, mother, oh. <laughs> you know, and you can hear it in the background of the thing. Like if you listen to it, you can literally hear it on the broadcast. Cause oh. I didn't know. And I walked the fucking curves and I'm like, God, Darn it, I lost. And he's like, and you can literally hear them announce the winner and you can hear me going, mother. And saying wow. it out loud. I'm like, oh, I remember. <laughs> it's clap, even though it's virtually. Because you are happy for everybody else. But, of course, you know, of course. You, you, wanna, you, wanna, you don't come in to not win. The nominations will win it itself, but you know, you want to take a statue. And thankfully- Of course, but I, I don't think this is going to be you your last one, time though. up though, bro. That's no, no, we got a season two of that show coming up and we got, we did get one statue for the show, which is cool. And since I directed the scene on the production company, I get that statue as well uh, with, for my office. It's not, you know, Timothy Woodward didn't win one. So I didn't win one personally, but my production company won one, my, uh, the show won one. So I get one to put there along with three big golden plaques. They sent me their freaking huge uh, yeah. and some certificates. So, you know, it's, it's but, a start. But it, that, it, 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 yes, but it also, it, it elevates street cred to a whole new level, a whole new level. Yeah, right? it helps. It has helped. It has helped. Yeah, it opens yeah. the doors, especially I wanted to get into TV more. Um, and I've had a lot of people that have reached out to me since that about doing projects. Well, episodic is the, episodic is, you know, you can really yeah. flesh out and develop characters other than in a two hour contained movie. Like, I get yeah, that. Yeah. I get that. Now, um, is there anything as far as the call that 
uh, in the trailer, the the visual effects, the the special effect makeup effects that were done on Lynn, like a lot of this stuff looks amazing. So, uh, is there anyone you wanted to give shout outs to um, that? Uh, because I mean, my entire team, I mean, Ching, Ching, who did all this stuff, she's worked with me on now seven movies. My makeup artist, um, and Lynn talks about it too. How you know, there's this, just I bring everybody on my projects, but she did the glamour makeup, she did the special effects, she brought in a few assistants, but. You know, it was uh, it was a challenge for her, but she's a freaking rock star, man. She's just, you know, I, I like to surround myself with people that know ahead of time. We're gonna go into this as a challenge. We're gonna try to do, you know, I know that this may seem like it's a, gonna be a walk in the park, but I'm gonna add a lot of stuff to it to make it more difficult. But it's gonna be not to just make it difficult. It's gonna be so we have something better. So there was right. a lot of things that we added and threw it at the last minute. We won't land it, you know, have this like fish scale veins and she's just a pro, man. She was just rocking it out. You know, it's not like she had tons of prep time to do it. She just did it. And uh, that was huge. And my, my uh, art design and my production designer in my art department, Marcos, Caro, like they are rock stars. I mean, they're coming in, there's chains you see hanging up and the, all the, just the dungeon, the, the call world creating that, um, you know, the lady Sharon, whose house, the main one we shot in Gina Lynn's producers. There's just so many people in this movie that came together that gave so much i mean you know we didn't shit we had tobin bell cast only a few days before even though we've been talking about him for a long time you know we were just wow. hey let's go um and then jeffrey's punching up the dialogue and helping us with that and so you know there's just it was a complete team effort as as in, that, you know what, i've got this idea and i got what was there any moment where you're sitting in video village you know you're looking through the monitor the lights right Tobin's in the frame or Lynn's in the frame, you know, or Chester's in the frame. And you're, you, at, at, at one particular moment, you just in your head have that, this, this is exactly what I wanted. Like, is that like, is there one moment you can recall yeah. where you just went, this movie is going to rock. So there were several, to be honest with you. Uh, the first one was the very first time we did the phone. We, did, we shot the phone stuff kind of in order, uh, but I didn't want to do it. Usually you'd go in with the location and you say, okay, let's get all the phone calls. Let's block it. I didn't want to do that this time. So I said, let, let, let's go through these kids like in order the phone call so we can feel it out and see how we need to do it. Because it could have been really repetitive doing the same thing. So each one has to do that in their transitions. But the first time we lit that room, it was like a big, this really crazy feeling. Uh, and then there was just Lynn and Tobin seen together. You get chills immediately. As soon as they started with each other, it was like, Oh crap. And then we were spending the big day at the high school where it was pure eighties. We got 30 or 40 extras going around. It's, you know, everybody's got the big hair, the cars are all in the background and we've got long steady cam shots starting on one girl coming over, leading us into our was guy. That, was, this the thing, said, the hey, amuse yeah. was this the amusement park thing? The, no, no, no. This is not even in the trailer. So oh, they, okay. there's a big high school scene that it starts in the 80s. Okay. And it's his shot. And so when Jeff comes out of the bathroom, I was like trying to give him a proper introduction. And so I made all this up where we just start on this car, this girl, bring him over. Then I have him doing a thing where he's, you know, he's, he's kind of not, he didn't shake it off well enough. So as these girls are walking by him, he has to look down and the camera goes down, you see this little spot. So it's a great introduction to him because he's, oh shit you know, kind of coming in, but there was all these just elements of cars and people and swipes and just everything to make this shot fluid. And we got it to work. And then the rest of the day was just rock and roll where we were just kind of just moving through. And that was the day before the carnival. Then we went into the carnival with those same wow. people so we could block our extras out and really go. Dude, the but yeah, there was just carnival, a lot of moments in this. Yeah. Carnival stuff is hard, man. I, I've worked on two other projects. I did, uh, we're the Millers. And they had that whole carnival scene mm -hmm. uh, in that, the, the Jason Sudeikis movie um, and Jennifer Aniston. And yeah. anytime you have to mobilize something that large and all the lights are glowing oh and that, you know, it's, that's, yeah. that's insane. That's insane. And then I, I did another one where we were at yeah. a state fair, um, uh, another film. Uh, uh, it was a Nicholas Sparks movie, but I think almost every Nicholas Sparks movie, they, they go to some sort of county fair but um some sort of care, yeah. but the but i yeah. know the, the lighting no, it's, it, and and was, those scenes were at night too weren't they yeah yeah, yeah and no, that's even harder and it was tough it was, uh, 
Yeah, well, you're talking about your AD. You know, Tim G did a great job. Zeb, who helped produce it. Leah, my line producer. You know, we were there ahead of time. They're going to me. You know, they came to me with coffees in hand, double hand, fisted here. <laughs> and I'm looking at it going, okay, so this just got set up this morning. The Ferris was out of power. It's not working properly. The lights aren't going. This is going. That's, you know, so it's like immediately you have all the the things that are there, but then out of that becomes creativity. Okay, okay, let's do a steady cam shot. Let's bring them through and let's, while they're getting this, let's figure this stuff out. Um, but you know, all those pieces have to come together. The AD has to make sure that the people are coming through. The lights have to be consistent to be able to cut constantly, even though they're flickering. You have to have the mirror go around. It can't go in the person's on it and this, this, this way, the carousel. So you have to have all these elements. And then we had inside these tents where there's like a fortune reader, there's a Yes, the lights lights have to be constant. Your your uh, your carousel has to be going. There's just so many elements that you know have to kind of match up, and you have to rock and roll with. You know, you have to you have to do it, um, especially when you're doing it like we did, where you know one shot's thirty seconds. It's going to go throughout, and it's going to have to flow because I didn't give myself an option to go into coverage like that. I wanted to make this cut go directly into this cut, go directly into that cut and, you know, make it work to get a good intro going. Um, and, uh, you know, there's challenges, man, but it's like, fuck, that's so amazing because you push yourself so hard on the day where you feel like, wow, but then afterwards you watch it and, you know, everybody's hugging at the end, like we just pulled that off. How do we wow. just do that? Wow. And just to, again, work with people over and over and you all feel that energy and everybody's like, you know, at lunch, you're like, this is the worst, we're gonna die. We're never going to finish, but then you wrap it and you got it. Everybody wants to hug. Everybody's like, we did it. We just, you know, we did what, you know, we kind of, we went against everything and we made this happen, you know, and, you know, it's just a big round of applause for everybody. But those feelings that high, that, that, you know, that energy is what you do this for, you know, you, you live to, to kind of push yourself to a boundary, you know? And the the sound design too. I mean, you know, when you've got Tobin, who is the voice of all the Saw movies and you're always hearing him and that the, like on a telephone, you almost have to like, make sure that's perfect or fans are going to be like, yeah. Oh, well, you know, that's just, you know, but it's like, you have to, you have to get that and nail that. Like, did, was there any stress about sound design after the fact? Yeah. You know, you can, you can really screw up a horror movie without good sound design. So that's one, you know, well, and, 85% uh, of your movie is sound design and, too. Yeah, definitely. And it's like, uh, but you know, with horror, you have this extra element that I never knew about before I did a horror movie of, where you can take people out of suspense because you want to throw a big bang in there that doesn't need to be, um, you know, the music can go up and swell up. And sometimes those moments are way better when you just cut everything off and you can hear the footsteps and there's nothing there. Sometimes a scare is better without a bang. So there's like a lot of growing that you have to do with that. But with Tobin, I mean, that guy could read me a book. <laughs> he, he could read a nursery rhyme to me and I would just sit there and listen because his voice is that phenomenal, man. It's like yeah. just hello. And he just <laughs> talks like that. It's not him doing that. He just he just really is that good. But but beyond that, like his scenes that he did, honestly, when people see the film, they comment on it left and right because it's just he's captivating. The guy is a beast. He's so underrated with just his eyes, his 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 emotion that he's putting into it, everything he's doing is so good, you know. And uh, they're in in that one scene that where he's in the living room, kind of explaining the rules of everything and how it's going to go. That's an 11, 12 page scene that feels like wow. five minutes. And there's five, four other characters in there, and we're circling him around and going all over the room. So it's you know, it, it was a challenge to find out how did we shoot this where there's beats where he's going to move and boom, where the where it changes, where there's new information. And they're like, I'm not going to do it because of this. And he's like, well, that's what you think. Boom. And here's why. And boom. And then going over here and there's a moment where, you know, he's, I'm stay on him while he's taking a, a drink of something. And you can hear the kids in the background. And a lot of the reviewers have commented on how powerful it was to just stay that because you could, it's all through what he's seeing. Um, so I try to do that a lot. You know, it's one thing that you learn more with a, as a filmmaker is like, how do you connect with the audience? And sometimes it's not just following the protagonist around, you know, it's not just seeing them from the front. It's finding out who that scene affects how and what's going to be more interesting for the audience. And by them whispering it 
and being around, we're pulling in closer to Tobin because we want to hear what they're saying. And so it's bringing us closer to that. And even yeah. though I don't cut to them, you can almost imagine what they're doing in their heads. And so there's some power in that. So like I said, I, I really enjoyed doing this movie and, you know, I'm enjoying people getting to see it. And I was going, I was in the drive through our uh, drive in in LA. We brought 15 cars to opening night. That was us. There was almost 200 there. So like 180, we had no clue who they were, not even a clue that were just lined up to see the movie. And it was the best feeling of my life because there was no, you know, big, Hey, we're doing anything. I announced at four o'clock on Facebook. Hey, anybody wants to join us go. And again, we had 15 people like 15 cars. There was 180 something other cars. And I was walking through that crowd, the cars, doom, doom, doom. And I'm like, just passing by like couples and they're like, grabbing you're, you're like you know holding on to each other like doing this and doing that and it's just it was such an incredible feeling because it's like wow this is not a room full of people that I know this isn't a premiere where people are going to be this is just people like really getting down with this movie and watching it in the drive-in and 1980s movie like where you would normally be doing that kind of stuff and so it's just a really surreal cool feeling to be there and to experience all that and so yeah. this whole thing has been a little surreal for me well, that's great. The, 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 the premiere that you're going to in Vegas, is that a drive, a drive, uh, yeah. in theater as well? Do no, you that's a regular theater. Oh, it's regular. a regular theater. Okay. And, uh, and uh, it's inside of a casino. Okay. Inside of a cas casino. Okay. And, um, you know, you and I were talking the other day about the cinema safe, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've really gone out of their way yes. to do public cinema service, safe. public it's service announcements and let people know. Million. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've done more than that. They've been in their ear systems and, and they've, they've literally added so many elements of safety where they've got the plexiglass up, they're requiring masks. Uh, their air systems now suck out, you know, the, the different air particles and all kinds of stuff. So they, they just have really good air. Yeah, I, I heard that the, the, ar the arc light put in, uh, the arc light put in um, a HEPA filters throughout their entire AC yeah. system. They pulled it out. A lot of them have. Yeah, a lot of them have to do that to make it where, you know, people feel safe in there. Um, and, you know, and, and we were talking to them about data points in, in, in Nevada and going, hey, you know, has, has anyone, if you had any breakouts from this? Have you, and, you know, there's no reported breakouts from theaters. There's nothing like that because, again, they've literally got it set up where they're, they've got air flow going through. So it's not just, you know, like like in a Target, they're not going to have that kind of stuff. They're not having yeah. that stuff in the, in the mall. And, you know, just the safety procedures are there where they're not, you know, every single before, before and after every show, they wipe down the seats completely. There's plexiglass up. They're doing so much. And so, I, you know, I just hope that more people will start looking at Cinema Safe at least and making your mind up off of that. Going, right. Hey, do I feel safe? No, these protocols are in place. And every theater's not, doesn't have a Cinema Safe stamp. But if you go to their website, you can find out which ones do and which chains do. But uh, you hope they see that so they can then make their choice because it would be a shame for movie theaters to, to go out, which a lot of them are having a hard time right now. Yeah, I, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping they'll get bailed out in another stimulus package because they, they, they really need to. I mean, they've been completely ignored throughout this whole thing where yeah. everyone else like the NFL and, and basketball and everything, they've, they've all been kind of given this, this green light. And, and I think in, in my state, uh, they, they're only allowing theaters at 30% capacity, but that's not going to cut it because they, they you just opened up too. You just opened up like last week. Last it was week. Just a, but last but, week, cause I know that, you got a call from theaters there. So yeah. yeah. And so it's, and it's, it, it's frustrating. Capacity. Yeah. And it's hard because, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of blockbusters. They don't have really big movies right now. And, you know, then it makes it really hard because like, I know we sold out of several places that people couldn't get in because it was 25% capacity. And those theaters are like, God, we'd have loved the popcorn sales, the, the stuff, because they have to staff it up. They have, you know, they have to pay the power bill. They have to pay their employees. They have to keep jobs going. And it's all based so on concessions because they don't, yes. they don't make a lot of money off ticket prices at all. And people don't no. understand that. They think when they hear a movie made $100 million at the box office that the theaters are doing well. And that's not necessarily the case. No. Um, no, uh, no. It's because you've yeah. got 2,000 play, 2,000 screens are playing that, you know, 2,500 screens are playing it. 
then they're taking their percentage, then they're breaking it down even further than that. And on a blockbuster, sometimes a theater can only get 30% of that divided by 2,500. You know, that number goes down dramatically. Yeah. However, when a family comes in and buys popcorn, soda, drinks, they keep 100% of that. And that's, so that's where really they pay right. their power and light bill and their labor yeah. and staff. So yeah. They need, they keep coming in in order to do that. Um, minus ticket sales. And there's a lot of places too where you can't have concessions. And that's like San Francisco just started well, allowing it, but you can't do concessions. You, and so they say, how are they going to make any money? They're not going to make any money that's if you can't allow them yeah, to so have concessions. Open. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, they're like, we're not going to open our theater. Yeah, it's a shame. I think it's going to change uh, over time. And I think we're going to see a huge resurgence once the population. Uh, um, uh, when, once all this stuff gets behind us, man. Uh, uh, I really hope so too, man. I, I hope that they can make it through that. I, I do. I hope that the studios will start going, hey, look, these theaters are our partners. Let's, let's do something. Let's give content. Listen, if, um, they, can, know, if they can bail out in 2008 the automotive industry to the tune of $350 billion, you can give three or four theater chains that are the, the, the largest theater chains in the country uh, a bailout just to float them six months or seven months, uh, but just on their construction loans and things like that. Like you don't have to, you know, and, and, and in that respect, sure. like Netflix, which created a $100 million fund for out of work employees, uh, the studios could come together and create a super fund to help out because without the theaters to show the movies, they don't make money. So it's like, it's a symbiotic relationship between the, the exhibitors sure. and, 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 the, the, and the studios. You know, it's, not just the main, it's not just the main three though. Cause you've got like, we're playing in, I think almost 40 different theater chains. Yeah. You well, know, so yeah. you have some of these, that you, are, everyone needs 40, a piece. you know they own yeah. 40 locations you know 40 locations those are the ones that are hurting a lot worse amc's got a cash flow burn you know but they've got stock and they've got other ways of raising money yeah. parents you know these other companies they don't yeah these smaller circuits um that you know maybe they own 40 50 locations some of them own 10 locations uh marcus theaters for example owns um, 90 locations and they're cut back where they can only have 51 open right now um, you know, those are the ones that aren't going to be able to go off off their stock prices and other things and maybe raise funds. They really rely on this stuff. So I'm, I'm nervous that all those smaller chains, the 40 or 50 that are out there, are going to be hurt by this if something doesn't happen soon. Yeah, but we at have the same we, time. I have. I was just going to say we I have hope. we we have our stone theaters, which owns I think it's like five yes. or six theaters uh, here locally. Yeah. And one of the managers is, is, a, is a good friend of mine and they had to close um, uh, yeah. because they, it's not enough foot traffic uh, for them to remain open um, uh, at 30%, uh, yeah. especially once the yeah. James Bond movie kicked and then you're hearing Wonder Woman might go to streaming on HBO Max. Well, Wonder Woman moved from October 2nd, thank God. That actually blessed us a little bit there because <laughs> right. we had to take that. Right. It's a potential but, uh, mixed Wonder blessing there. there. Yeah, that was a mixed blessing. I'm not going to lie. I was happy about that one. But then it was like Candyman moved from the 16th. Then there was uh, the uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson. What's the movie? The uh, Black Marvel Widow movie moved. Black Widow moved. Yeah. And then everybody knew inside. I was hearing James Bond was going to move for a while. Yeah. Um, and we knew that it, Wonder Woman was going to try to push till December. But there's a good chance it may move. Um and so it just, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it's terrible. You hope that it gets better with the studios, but at the same time, there is an opportunity where, you know, smaller films are getting in the theaters now more, kind of like there was in the seventies where, you know, these smaller movies are finding a home. I mean, with us, you know, we're on week two now and, you know, they're like, yeah, there's several, I think over a hundred that have already said, you know, we want week three and four already. So we're like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> so you get these amazing opportunities to be this small film and be in, you know, these theaters for six, seven weeks, eight weeks, maybe, you know, and just have all these eyeballs get to see it. So there is opportunity there. And that part's a blessing, but you never want your opportunity to come at anyone else's downside. You sure, know I mean? sure, so, sure. You know, Happy for it. But at the same time, I, I understand the, the where the theaters are and stuff. Uh, and with that said, you know, the call is this weekend. Um, I'd love for everybody to check it out. You know, it's, it's in your theaters and drive-ins. We're playing at uh, 200 locations um, that you can find it on showtimes.com. You can go to Fandango if we're in your local area. Thecallmovie.com has every state 
and location. Um, so we are playing in several locations in uh, North Carolina. However, the theater's just opened up. So I think it's Greensboro. Uh, there's a few others that you can see on our site um, and Showtime's. And Showtime's broken down by state. In South Carolina, we're playing in several, including Charleston, South Carolina. We just started playing the Citadel Mall this weekend. They requested us, and so we added that. Um, so, you know, we, we want people to go out, see it, spend an hour and a half. You know, it's a great Halloween flick. If you could see it in a drive-in, it's a great experience that way, too. Um, and, you know, hopefully you'll just be entertained for an hour and a half and you'll enjoy yourself. And, um, you know, it's cool. And it's also always great. Like I said, I could sit down and talk to you for a long time about all this stuff. Uh, so it's great to do it. So hopefully you'll, as you grow, you'll have me back on the show. Maybe oh, yeah. I can get Jeffrey Reddick and some other, we can have a good time, you know, yeah. and, and, and have more time this and uh you have a better background too I, I will not have the curtains and you know i just kind of jumped in here real quick but uh because i've actually got a couple of arcade games out in my living room now that'll be good okay NBA oh yeah that's a, Turtles, so that's a good back that's a that's a good background that's a good well, background. look you got jaws going on and you got your whole thing hooked up so yeah, yeah i'm excited though man i want to i want to come back on here and uh i really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me to say the kind words to plug it and uh just talk, get the word of this movie out and check out the trailer, give it a shot. We'll yeah. announce the home video dates whenever they come. However, I can tell you DVD and Blu-ray and all the regular stuff will be a few months at least because we're going to be in theaters for a while. Um, you know, whatever we do as far as digital goes, it's still up in the air. So we'll see what happens. I'm just enjoying it while it is. Well, you know? look, Timothy Woodward Jr., Emmy nominated director, executive uh, producer, and writer, director of the new movie, The Call, and uh, proud to call my friend. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. And uh, I'm going to have all the links to the trailers, to social media, to everything, all in the description uh, in this video um, uh, once, it's, once it's uploaded. So everybody, go see The Call. Thanks, Tim. Yes. Pick up the phone. <laughs> Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Spotlight with Sean O'Rourke. Don't forget, check out all the links that we talked about in the description below. Make sure you check out my social media, share this video, and we'll see you on the next one.